very much. The, the latest uh, Australian uh, annual CO2 emissions uh, for the year till March 2020 uh, says there were 528.7 million tonnes released. Our uh, CO2 from bushfires is not included in those numbers and it's not included in the Paris targets. The Federal Government uh, Department of Environment has estimated that some 830 million tonnes of CO2 was released in the six weeks till February to 11th this year. Bearing that in mind, and on that basis, is there any merit in trying to set any CO2 reduction targets for 2050? Uh, Darren Chester, why don't we have a target for 2050? Well, that I don't think was really where the question was going. Is about when you have bushfires, do you measure those as well? Now, the, the, it raises a very important point. When, when Australians uh, voted at the last three elections, they voted the coalition, and they voted for an evolutionary approach to this reduction, not a revolutionary approach. So when I say that, I'm saying they're looking at us to balance the needs of reliable, affordable energy. They want that, of course they want that, and they want us to do our share in terms of overall emissions. I think Australians instinctively understand sure. that we contribute less than 2% of total global emissions, and they recognise we need to do our share as part of global agreements. Now, when, it's, when people with, in my election... Sorry, with respect, uh, Mr, the, the question, though, issues, was, is there any merit in trying to set a CO2 reduction target for 2050? So I, I just want to bring you to that point. Well, we, we set a target for Kyoto in 2020 and we met it, and we've set targets for 2030 and we're on track to meet that as well as part of the Paris Agreement. It would be unfair to the Australian people for us to set a target for 2050 if we can't tell them how we're going to pay for it and how we're going to do it. Now, right now we're on track for our 2030 uh, agreements with the Paris Agreement, which is a 26 to 28% reduction of our emissions based on the 2005 figures. Now, that is our, our approach. It's a responsible approach. It's one the Australian people have endorsed at the last three elections, and we're, we're fair income about it. We're trying to deliver reliable, affordable energy for households, for small business, for manufacturing, but at the same time doing our share in terms of emissions reduction, but recognise this is a global issue, not an Australian issue that we can solve by ourselves. Marion Wilkinson, I mean, that was a fairly honest response there about not committing to a target because we don't know effectively how to pay to get there. Well, I certainly uh, agree with Darren that they don't know how to get to a 2050 net zero target and that's absolutely clear and I think it is the reason why Scott Morrison and Angus Taylor won't commit to it uh, because if they were going to commit to that target they wouldn't be starting from where they are now which are very weak 2030 targets um, and no real way to get to uh, a 2050 target of net emissions. The question is, will the rest of the world let us get away with that? And I don't think actually they will. And I think this is one of the... Well, what do you mean by that? Well, at the moment, if you look at the statements that were made recently by Prime Minister Scott Morrison and by Angus Taylor, we're now in a position where you have the two most senior politicians talking about energy in this country in 2020 and never uttering the words climate change in their major speeches. And I think that we really do have to bring this back to reality, which is the world has signed up to the Paris Agreement. If we are going to get there, Australia will be expected to play its part, and that's not what we're doing at the moment. And more than that, we're doubling down on saying that we are going to have a gas-led recovery and do this with fossil fuels. OK, we, we're going to get to that later in the program. Mike, what, what do you make of Darren Chester's response? Um, look, it's, it's standard set of talking points. I find it, I find it laughable when politicians... Sorry, Darren, no offence. Uh, say that they're not into long-term planning, they don't know how to do that. That's, that's the job. We're trying to plan what the nation's going to do in the next 10, 20 and 30 years. We have all sorts of other plans that are very... We build roads and we expect them to last for 30 years. We can build emissions targets and set them and get to them, right? Um, we can certainly set a 2050 target. We don't know how to pay for it. Is, 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 it's bunkers. Lots of ways we can pay for it. Lots of ways we can get there. Um, however, what the business community needs is certainty. Not having that target, not having legislated steps towards that target means we don't have the certainty to get the investment. That will do more to drive up your prices of power and all the other things they want to talk about than anything else they're doing, right? If we had legislated targets for each 10-year period or five-year period, 
we'd have so much more certainty for investment. Uh, we started this program, though, talking about the problems for government in solving problems like bushfire recovery. And you acknowledged yep. how hard it is for government to solve things that seem like simple problems. I mean, obviously, it's easy for business people to come along and say, it's simple, and their answers are bunkum. What, what, what is the way to get there? Um, I mean, look, the, the simple way to get to net zero emissions is you have to electrify everything and move your entire electric, electricity generation to renewables, right? This is uh, happening all over the world and we know the, the simple two-stage recipe. But then what happens to all the people in Darren's electorate with jobs that rely on the industries that exist currently? The industries that exist currently will be continued to be powered by electricity. It will just be cheaper electricity from a renewably powered grid. Um, the, the, those, those industries, if their industries are generating fossil fuels, <clears throat> those are industries that... We should uh, uh, thank them greatly for their service. They've gotten Australia to where, where we are. They've powered us through the Industrial Revolution. Um, we should be very grateful to them. We should help those, uh, those industries and those particular workers to transition over the next, call it, 20 years. Absolutely, we should do that with, with grace and with empathy. I, I can see Darren's trying to get in here. Well, uh, I'm actually just laughing. It's 70% uh, of Victoria's energy supplies right now come out of Latrobe Valley, out of the coal-fired power stations in Latrobe Valley. And Mike can say it's bunkum, but that's what keeps the lights on in Victoria today. That's what keeps the surgeries operating, operating in our hospitals. That's what keeps the manufacturing sector going in Victoria right now. Uh, people in my electorate, in my community, are all for renewables. Absolutely, they're for renewables. They recognise they have an important role to play and it's probably going to be a bigger role into the future. But, but don't mislead them and tell them you're going to switch over to uh, completely renewable energy sources in the time frames that uh, you're talking about right now. I mean, let's think be we'll honest get there with in the people in the community. And, well, you're, you're, now you're talking about a different time frame, Mike. You're putting words in my mouth that's the third time, three times in a row. Well done. What I'm saying is the Loyang A and Loyang B are both slated to go out to 2046 and 2048. Your Loyang W about 2032. Now, don't pretend to people that you're going to get replace all of that with renewables in the next five or ten years, as some other people are trying to pretend. But hang on a second. We're talking about a 2050 target, and you've said they'll all shut down in 2030, 2046, and 2048. So can we get there by 2050? Yep. And so my, so my, so my comment earlier, which you uh, tried to misrepresent as well, Mike, was quite simply, we do not go to the Australian people and tell them we're going to do something until we can prove how we're going to do it and tell them how we're going to pay for it. Right now, we've put forward our plan for 2030, which is 26 to 28 per cent reduction in our emissions, and we're going to achieve that. We've had the technology roadmap that the Minister released last week, which outlined $18 billion worth of investment to work with the private sector, which we hope will generate, or expect to generate, more than $50 billion worth of investment in new technologies as well. So they're all... Uh, plans that I think will deliver the emissions reductions in a way that the Australian people will understand and appreciate the approach the government's taking. It's a responsible approach. It's an approach we've taken the Australian people three times uh, over the last uh, five or six years and been re-elected. And we, we're explaining to them and bringing them with us. We can't do this without the Australian people on side.